Welcome to the September 11, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.05. We have all members present except Laura and staff present are Aaron and Dave Zomek is not here tonight. Um, so Aaron, do you mind pulling up our PowerPoint for tonight? Of course. Uh, we're starting off with comments from me. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that it's come to my attention that town and staff, specifically Aaron, has been contacted about invasive management on private lands in the town. And if there's members of the public present and also for commissioners for outreach, I want to draw everybody's attention to the resource of the UMass extension programs for these. Um, that is very much a tax funded land grant university program and they have experts in everything from tree disease to invasive removal. So if you have people contacting you or you're doing any kind of personal outreach, please keep in mind that the UMass extension services are an excellent public resource for anything from ticks to tree disease to um, managing invasives on your property. So that's it for me. Dave's not there. I see Alex hand up. So go ahead, Alex. I have a hard stop around 745. Okay. Let's shoot for that, Alex. Thank you. Bruce. Um, and I have a, a two minute note when you get the chance before we go on to the rest. Okay. How about now, Bruce? Go ahead. So this is to inform you that the Fort River Watershed Association is doing a project to enhance the Fort River watershed. Um, and there is basic frame is that each of the conservation commissions is having one person participate. And then we're reaching out to people from other agencies and institutions, uh, environmental groups, land trusts, fish and wildlife service, state agencies, et cetera. Um, you'll hear more about it as the days go by. Um, Dave Zomek is uh, representing the Town Conservation Commission in the program, and our goal is to find ways to have projects that are cross-boundary and cross-topic um, so that we do better about our communicating uh, with each other and the other conservation commissions, and we do better about seeing things that actually can get done rather than I started out calling it a visioning process. I stopped calling it that because it's not way up here. It's let's find three or four actual projects that could get funded and could get done to enhance the Fort River watershed. Um, the association is sort of the manager facilitator of the project and that's where we are. Thanks Bruce. Um, I think we had talked about Dave being our liaison should we have him be in contact oh, with the... him already? Okay. Yeah. So we're good with that. That's a solid yeah. contact yeah. connection. All good. Okay, great. In fact, I think I've interviewed all of the commission representatives now. So okay. they're, they're connected. Well, um, please keep us posted and I'll just okay. sort of eke out some room in the director's report for that, Bruce. Thanks. Okay. Little, little pieces as we go by. The first meeting is October 17th, and then you'll hear some, some more about it after that. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on, director is not here. Um, conservation land use applications. We have none, we had a very last minute application. We might get to that um, contextually later. Um, and so, we're on to the land use subcommittee um, contacts. I am so, I'm thinking, Aaron, maybe we wanna just like take care of business and then we can reserve time for that. What do you think? I okay, think we, that would be we, fine, yeah. Okay, we only have a couple things to knock off the agenda otherwise. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to just jump in? Yeah, please okay. give us your... Okay, so Wildflower, I have no updates. Um, I did send an email to the owner kind of pleading for an update, still no response. Um, there's a request for certificate of compliance um, on the 
agenda um, that is tabled because the submission was incomplete and there's some additional information that's needed. Um, also, just to get it off the, the docket, um, the order of conditions for Montague Road, um, we've had some back and forth. I've had some back and forth with them this week. Um, they have worked to they've basically they've granted us a 21 day extension on issuance of the order of conditions because their um revisions have been a little um kind of clunky i guess you could say like we we've i requested the revisions that were requested at the last meeting the document came back to me missing a bunch of stuff so they're working to update it and get sort of a final polished version that's ready for issuance in the order but it's it's close um it's just like a final map that basically needed a, a final edit and it wasn't ready for tonight so i didn't want to issue on that okay thanks um so back to wildflower drive can we specifically ask for i think we, we discussed last time a site visit at the end of November so within the month well so that was at Trillium um oh sorry wildflower yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh so wildflower is the other enforcement site but it's right there um we can look at it okay. while we're have out we, that, that way have they um been in communication about that request the site visit at the end uh, of um I did email Iman but it was it was to be fair it was like I want to say like middle of well end of last week so I haven't heard back from him but I'm sure that it will be fine they've been very okay. cooperative um so so maybe know. we can tie those in together and if anybody can do it they're very close um literally a minute or 30 seconds if not less apart um and it would be helpful to have some commissioner eyes on both the properties that haven't seen it before okay um we don't if, yeah, I, I, I did ask Iman for a couple dates that would work for him, and then we'll hash it out as a board. Yeah, finalize. and I and I'd like that to include the board's av availability above all too, um, as well as yours, of course. Um, okay, and so we have a request for extension of order on conditions. Well, Jason had his hand up too. I don't know if he's. No, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay, okay, so. Um... So the request for um, extension of order of conditions. So I don't want to glaze over this. Um, I'm going to throw myself on the board's mercy a little bit tonight um, and kind of explain this very challenging situation. So um, I regularly get a lot of requests from people who are looking to find out when their permits expire. And calculating when permits expire has been particularly challenging um, for permits that were issued during the governor's COVID tolling period, because the, the tolling period basically, you know, for permits that were valid up to the date, um, and I, I think it was like March, um, I can't remember the exact date in March, but it's like a date in March 2020, if it was valid on that date, it's eligible for a 462 day extension. I was contacted by a homeowner, the homeowner or the landowner at 82 um, pa uh, Pomeroy saying, um, could you tell me the, the expiration date on my permit? And we use a, a software internally to develop to to determine what the, the expiration dates are. I run this calculation all the time for landowners to try to make sure they have the right date for their expiration on their permit. OK, so I'm going to try to explain this as succinctly as I can. On the software that we use, there is a, a toggle switch basically for um, business days and calendar days. And when I ran the calculation, I didn't realize that the, that the um, toggle had switched to business days. So when I ran the calculation, it gave me a August 2024 expiration. And so I told them, OK, your deadline's the end of August 2024. You're all set for a while. And they assumed they were all set. And then their environmental consultant contacted me a while later. We were talking about some, you know, their project or whatever. And he, he, I think it was him who inquired again and said, could you just verify the expiration date? And I ran it again. And it was January 2024. At this point, the date had already passed, um, like long past. It was it was like <laughs> summertime. And I'm like, what is going on here? So I I couldn't figure out what had happened with the calculation. And I tried to sort it out. Long, long story short, um, 
this landowner was really upset and rightfully so. Um, their permit had expired um, unknowingly to them and they were given incorrect guidance from me. Um, so I contacted DEP and I explained the situation, how the calculation was messed up and it was not the landowner's fault. And DEP said, this is an extenuating circumstance. They're not gonna interfere with the commission issuing ex an extension. And they basically recommended that the commission grant the extension for three years um, for the applicant. So I'm asking the commission under the circumstances that I made an error and this landowner could have easily requested their three-year extension if they had known if the board would be willing to grant them a three-year extension um, from the date from the date that the permit would have expired, which would have been um, January fifth, twenty twenty-four. Um, so basically, three years from that date to allow them to be able to construct their house. So I'm asking the board if they, you would consider that, considering it was it was a simple human error on my part that caused the problem. Um, so, thank you, Ryan. Go ahead, Bruce. So that means to January 25th, 2027. Yeah, and you don't even need to put the deadline. Um, it'll okay. when I issue it, I'll I'll issue it for okay. the deadline of the original permit, so it'll carry forward. Okay, Jason. Um, Aaron, when did they originally contact you to see when their permit expired? Um, it was the summer of 2023. Okay. So All it was right. well before their permit would have expired. Okay. Good, Jason. Yep. Andre. Thank you. Um, I have no problem doing that. I think that, uh, you know, since it's uh, an issue that uh, kind of we as government slash commission created, uh, that uh, we need to fix it. So I have no problem with that, with extending it. Okay. Looking for a motion to issue a three year extension of order of conditions on DEP number 0890659 for 82 Palmer Lane. Oh, um, I see her. Hold on, I see Alex hand up. I'm just gonna. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, technically, it's not our responsibility to remind it, uh, people when their when their deadlines are. That's their responsibility. So I don't want to imply by doing this that in, even though Aaron is courteous and giving people information, the responsibility lies on them, not us, not Aaron. So if a if a an extension is granted, it's a courtesy. Understood, Alex. Thank you. All right, I will move but, that we extend for a period of three years the order of conditions for DEP file number zero eight nine dash zero six five nine for eighty two Pomeroy Lane, Map twenty C, Lot one fifty. Second. I have a motion by Jason and a second by Andre. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Well, thank you guys very much for your understanding. I appreciate it. Yeah. Soon that will all pass over. Yeah. Right. Uh, Except COVID itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think that's it for business and we can move on to our subcommittee agenda. Yes. Okay. Okay. To introduce this. Um, thank you, Alex, for preparing materials and getting them in the folders today. And thank you, Rachel, for giving comments and reviewing. Um, I was hoping Dave Zomek would be here because this is very much a an issue, particularly that he has um, extensive institutional knowledge as well as just direct knowledge being a uh, manager of lands for a long time. So given that he's not here to participate in the conversation, which he has been a participant in, in pretty extensive conversations with Bruce, Alex and I on the subcommittee, I'd like to basically review, um, introduce and review it, discuss Rachel's comments and just sort of open this for discussion. I, I don't know that we'll get to a vote tonight, um, but this is maybe one of the 
primary and major topics of um, land use management. And it's historically for Amherst been a very big deal. And Dave will talk about the dog wars when they've opened up uh, public meetings for this. So we are revisiting existing rules and um, sort of bringing them up to speed with current understanding of uh, dog use on conservation lands and better understanding of impacts to conservation areas. So there were two documents circulated, unfortunately, very sort of late. One was um, the document itself, uh, which Rachel provided comments on, and then very late in the game, I also provided a municipal literature review, and this is, I think, from the city of Portland that underwent a pretty substantial um, study for their municipality about uh, dog rules and dog impacts to conservation lands. I don't know who's had a chance to look at what, but both should be considered. And I think we can maybe just pull up, Erin, if you wouldn't mind pulling up maybe our current document, starting with the memo, which uh, seeks to define the issue at hand and provide some background. And I will say that, that um, Alex did a great job of balancing the need to be succinct and keep to a page while also addressing the very complex myriad issues related um, to dogs on conservation lands. So I think we'll just go through this sequentially and I will also give the floor to Alex. Alex, just raise your hand if you wanna to interject to any point. So Alex, um, Aaron, we're looking at a clean version right now. Um, Alex, go ahead. Is your intention to have this kind of a discussion with every item that we bring to the commission? Not necessarily. I thought that Dave Zomek would be here today. I think he's a very integral part of this conversation. Um, and also, I want to sort of take a poll to the commissioners uh, as to who, I guess, Jason and Andre, were you able to, did you have a chance to review it? No, my question is, we have an agricultural policy in front of people, and we'll have other policies in front of them. And I'm asking if you will uh, be unilaterally moving the discussion to the board on each one of them. I think I'd like to do that. I think I'd like to keep this conversation to within half an hour, if not 20 minutes. Um, I think that the discussion is probably the most uh, valuable part of this uh, movement on what the policies are. Um, like we certainly have never had enough time to discuss. So I'd like to give the board enough time to have a conversation about it. Um, I think some of them will go much quicker than others, but I think this one warrants due time. So given that Dave isn't here today, I just want to go through this. And you know what, Alex, this could also be sort of a, since this is our first up, we could make this our test count and see how it goes and then maybe tailor it from there. But um, we have some time. I think we have at least, you know, 40, about 20 minutes for you. So um, why don't we start? Why don't, why, don't you just, why don't you just do it? Yeah, I can't exactly see that, Aaron. Do you think you could make it a little bigger? Um. So I'm just gonna give some background on the issue. Amherst, Conservation lands are heavily used by people with dogs, and that's been increasing, especially since 2020. Um, that's just a nationwide trend. Before 2020, this was um, a contentious issue that's been raised several times in public meetings with great attendance in public meetings and a lot of contention. So there are some um, reference to a previous visiting of these rules. Um, I think Rachel um, commented on what exactly was determined at those, but prior to Dave's tenure, there the rules that are currently in place, which is off-leash laws from in the mornings at uh, Lower Mill River 
and Amethyst Brook were determined, and that was the result of very significant public hearings and discussion. And that's what it has been for a long time. Yet there remains um, conflicts with the public and different kind of uses on these lands. This is very much elucidated by the open space um, and recreation survey where conflicts with off-leash dogs was raised as a primary concern with users of conservation lands. So we do know that it is an existing issue for users of public uh, lands. We do know that it is a primary use of conservation lands and it is a valued use of the people of Amherst. There are tangential things like people from out of town coming to use the lands. There are things like um, commercial dog walkers using the lands. There are definitely um, conflicts, which we also know from Dave, are underreported, under recorded, um, as there's not really a current database or really tallying or any kind of keeping track of how many complaints or how many altercations there have been between off-leash dogs or dogs and people and dogs and dogs. But there are more than what we, than anyone would know there to be. They just get handled sort of under the rug. So those are the issues. And just to say that it is an issue and that's why we're spending time on this. Um, we are at no point in conversation about not allowing dogs on conservation land. Dogs are allowed on all conservation land. So this is sort of honing in on what the exact uh, regulations are around dogs on conservation land. So getting into this document, I see a lot of um, track changes. So I'm gonna just roll into the into the yellow here. Um, okay. For those of you who haven't read it, um, I think we're just gonna go through it uh, sequentially. Can I explain this memo? Sure, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and first of all, I don't know why the text is red. Um, but anyways, I drafted this as a way to sort of summarize the issue because it doesn't say anything in the policy statement about use. And um, um, one of the things that has happened, we believe, and Rachel commented on this, is that dog use increased during COVID. And a lot of pets were, a lot of dogs were purchased during COVID. And uh, so it's our feeling that use of dogs on conservation land went up during COVID and has stayed there. Rachel commented and wanted to know how many dog licenses were issued in 2024. And I made a call today to the assess to the town clerk's office to try and get a number. And that's still in process. So I don't have an answer for you, Rachel. So um, the statement about increasing use is the general sense of people who watch the trails or work the trails. And that's where that, and also nationally, that was a trend. So just trying to address your comment about um, the increase of use. I don't have an answer for you yet, Rachel. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify um, that it seemed like during COVID, the COVID pandemic, um, it wasn't just dog owners, it's all users um, increased use. So in, in our state and nationwide, um, there are there are data sets supporting just um, massive increases in, in use of conservation areas, which, you know, you think about these areas that already have conflicts and you increase use and intensity and density, you we're gonna experience probably more conflicts in those in those areas. Right. Quite true. And so here we are. Um okay, so I'm gonna just move on to the uh, okay, I think the second one is about I'm sorry, I'm just trying to really look at this very small text. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm is this actually showing the changes that Rachel made, um, or is this? Yeah. 
It is? Okay. So it seems to be all changed, however. <laughs> okay. It's like all track changed. I'm not sure this is the one that I reviewed before. So I know that one thing that is coming up is there. Can we go to the rules? Can we just like move from the memo? Go ahead, Bruce. I, I just, I think the rules is a very straightforward way to do this and, and the memo supports the rules. So let's start with the rules. Um, so commercial dog walkers. So a land use regulation and rule is that there is no commercial use of conservation lands. So that is a primary reason why commercial dog walkers are not allowed. Secondary to that is um, an, like the observation that there have been problematic dog walking, commercial dog walking enterprises on conservation lands that have caused trouble for other users. And to your point, Rachel, that has been related to the number of dogs being used. So it's sort of multifaceted here. So that number of dogs being used called attention to the fact that these lands are being used by even out of state people coming to Amherst conservation lands to walk regional dogs on conservation lands and there's commercial enterprise happening on conservation lands. So fundamentally that's um, not in accordance with our land use regulations. And then secondary to that, it's just the problem that sometimes like half of these seven dogs are off leash and there's not <laughs> adequate control happening. And that's something that Dave Zomek has commented on. And um, that, so that's just to respond to you there. So that really is a response to the Amherst land use regulations. So I see your point about equity of older people sort of needing people to walk their dogs. And sometimes that could be a one-to-one -one ratio. And I'm trying to explain the basis of this law or this rule. And I'm seeing hands. I'm going to call on Bruce first. Well, I was just going to point out that Alex is an experienced trainer of dogs, and so his views have been embedded within these documents. True, and number it's two is commercial dog training. Yeah. Um, so that addresses commercial dog walkers. Um, okay, Alex, go ahead. We can't hear you, Alex. Are you on mute? It says you're on mute right now, so maybe. All right, Alex wants a, a break. Okay, I'm just gonna move on to commercial dog training classes and we're gonna let Alex weigh back in on that because as Bruce said, he does have experience. Um, there, the Amherst Dog Park was created specifically to take pressure off of places like Amethyst Brook and off-leash dogs use of that. I think the intention, and again, I wish Dave was here to describe this because this was his um, idea, I think, that um, activities such as that could pl take place in a designated area that weren't there for conservation purposes. And again, I just want to be explicit about the fact that Amherst Conservation Lands are conserved for the preservation of natural resources and sensitive species, sensitive habitats that exist there and water quality. Secondary to that is uh, residents' use of it. And residents' use of it includes dog walking, but dog walking is allowed on all conservation lands. And sometimes we're really honing in on off-leash dogs. So, I just want to point out that uh, we have a mission statement and we have regulations and this dog regulation exists within the context of those two things. Alex, can we hear you yet? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just had a microphone problem. I had to plug it in, unplug it, plug it in. We're good. Go ahead. 
to address Rachel's comment I, uh, about some people being infirmed and paying somebody to walk their singular dog or pair of dogs or whatever. I wonder if a solution to this in consideration of Rachel's comment might be instead of a blanket, no commercial use to put a number on the number of dogs, the, the commercial walking of more than X number of dogs is not allowed um, in order to give consideration to the kinds of people that Rachel pointed out. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear you guys on that. It still is in conflict with the non-commercial use uh, rule of conservation lands. And I wonder maybe if a workaround could be a permit application so that somebody that needs their dog walked and it's one dog or they could just specify that in a permit could just communicate to the town that they will be doing this. And honestly, it probably will go unnoticed unless there's an issue if it's just one dog. But um, that would both give them sort of license literally to do it and like also alert the town about what the current uses are um, and be consistent uh, with our rules and regs. Okay, I think Jason's up. Thanks. I don't know how much of how much how in depth of a conversation we want to have right now. Is this meant to really go into a bunch of things, or are we trying to keep this as more of an introductory, uh, just an introductory conversation to this? And you're looking for comments offline. Um, I mean, it would be great to have had comments offline for everybody to think about, but here we are. And I definitely expected, I expect this could take us six hours of a meeting, honestly, like this is the, this is the, it's not just us, it's the entire nation and, you know, continents, different continents are dealing with this exact problem. It's, yeah. it's a real problem. It's becoming greater expressed because of the, like Rachel said, and everybody has said, like the increase in use in conservation lands and the increase in conflicts between users. So I would like to allow um, time for this. And I'd also like to let you all go early. And I'd also like Dave Zomek to be a part of the conversation because he's had like 20 years of experience doing this. And he knows far more about what's actually happening on the ground than any of us do. Yeah. Um, but to that, do you want to do you want to make a comment on either number one or two at this time? Um, I guess my no. I I really want to make an overarching comment and ask a question about the dog park. You know, you mentioned that it was it was put into place to try to take some pressure off of Amethyst Brook. Do we have any idea if it's actually working, and is there any intention to? If it is working, is there any intention to put other dog parks in other parts of town? As far as I know, that's the only dog park in town. Is that correct? Yes. And I as can, far as, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Um, so I, I think the intention is not to put more dog parks, at least not at this time. Um, it They're incredibly expensive um, and very, very time taking to go through the whole sort of design, permitting, funding, construction process. Um, uh, so I think that at least answers one of your questions. Um, there Was there was there a second part to that that I missed? Is it taking pressure off? Um, um, yeah, is it working? No, uh, so I think the answer to that is, is not really. I think w one of the things that we've discovered with the dog park is that there are people who... And I think this comes down to probably mobility issues and and also like certain types of activity that people want to do with their dog at the dog park versus people who want to walk their dog um, and let their dog run sort of in a natural environment um, and sort of training recall and stuff like that. And so I think um, we haven't really seen a reduction in the use of conservation areas as was sort of originally thought it it serves a different purpose, I think, is right. the ultimate thing. Like a, a dog park isn't the same as, you know, a walk through Amethyst Brook in the woods. And any dog owner will understand that. It's um, not exactly convenient either. There's only a few parking spaces there. And, you know, unless you live right near it, you have to drive to it. 
as opposed to someone said, you know, most of these, most people have a conservation land within a five minute walk of their house. Yes. All good points. Um, Andre. So in reference to uh, item number one, um, commercial dog walkers and item number two, commercial dog training classes, you know, I don't think that, uh, I, I think like uh, the rules are set out already, uh, commercial use, I don't think should be, should be permitted. Um, there are, you know, let's remember that on, aside from conservation land, um, in the general vicinity, there are other lands that are accessible to folks. Can't hear you, Adrian, Andre. Oh, okay. I could, I could hear you, but yeah. maybe speak yeah. louder. I'll speak, I'll speak a little closer. How's that? <laughs> um, Alex, so, can so you hear? Are, I turned up my volume. That'll work too. Um, so there are uh, other lands aside from conservation lands available to folks to take uh, uh, to take dogs and so on, such as commercial uh, dog walkers or commercial dog training classes. I mean, I I, I don't know. I think um, I don't I don't see a good reason to uh, to change those rules. Um, let me just. I mean, I guess we're going to get to uh, we're going to get to uh, dog waste and um, all that stuff later, right? At some point, are we going? Yeah. To well, um, I mean, that's a rule. I think that is part of the memo, which describes why we are hashing out to the extent that we are these dog rules. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Alex did a good job trying to provide some background to all of this, which because uh, it does need context. You know, what, why, what is the purpose of not allowing some of these things? And because this is a very emotionally charged, you know, frankly, conversation, I think that some memo and um, context is absolutely needed. Um, it is kind of strange that and unfortunate that we're starting out with this one in particular because it's probably, I think, the most charged one of everything that we're going to talk about. But here we are. And as we're talking about it, I think I'd like to just review our, you know, one to whatever they are. And maybe everybody could go back and consolidate their thoughts and some comments to the text. And then um, when Dave's here, we could have a more succinct conversation. But I think formulating thoughts and talking about the background issues about this is, is important to the conversation. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, for numbers one and two, I just remind us as a whole and the subcommittee in particular, we will have to make sure that it's not in, um, that there's equivalency with regard to what constitutes commercial on the agriculture side. Because uh, unless someone is a really careful reader, they may basically say, well, these are the same thing. They're both commercial. Why not here when you're allowing it over there? So we don't need to talk about it now, but we do need to remember to make it really the same. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> yes, good point. Agriculture is its own sort of standalone situation. Um, Alex? Uh, my time is nearing when I'm going to turn into a pumpkin for a little bit. I can come back, but at the rate you're going, you haven't even gotten past one and two here. You're gonna be a long time. And yeah. I frankly think the best place to hash some of this out is in the committee. Um, this wasn't discussed in the committee to have this discussion tonight. Um, I think some of the comments are useful, but uh, that's why we, you know, we spent a year on all these things and we had to ask for an extension in order to get finished if we have i know alex but the realistic part of it is that people's uh the, the conversation is really where the great thinking and and things happen and i'm i'm 
was fully expecting that we'd have a longer conversation about the topics at hand where everybody could yeah. provide what they understood. So Thank would you prefer that we pause this because you aren't going to be here? No, you are no, you're doing a great job, but you unilaterally decided to bring this out of the subcommittee. It wasn't discussed and agreed upon. So have at it. I've got to step away. Okay, thanks, Alex. Okay, um, so we, number one and two are related to commercial uses and we've discussed the context of that. Okay, Andre, go ahead. Yeah, I was never done with my, uh, with what I was saying. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, as far, well, I guess I'm going to have to uh, do a little bit of uh, reviewing of what uh, what you guys have written so far. And then we'll have a bit more of a discussion of this. Is that what we're going to do in the future, Michelle? So the idea was that the subcommittee would do most of the discussion, discussing and that we'd bring to you the fruit of that labor and that everybody would review it on their own time come with comments and then we'd have a shorter discussion with the committee, the CONCOM about um, finalizing the rules. So realistically, um, a lot of the hashing out of these rules happens through conversation and I, I don't necessarily expect it to be easy, um, but I think that if everybody could do their background review and thinking offline and you know submit their comments which go to Aaron and then are provided to the rest of the commission so that we all know where everybody is on what page they are and then we have an informed discussion on a sort of like greater platform is probably the most efficient way to do it um but to be honest like the subcommittee doesn't have even enough time to discuss any of this stuff um it's complicated and it has a lot of background and a lot of history. And that's why I was sort of hoping Davis here to guide us tonight. Um, again, and I also think it was like difficult to start with dogs, but this was the one that was ready for the commission to review. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is ready yet. So here is where we start. Um, okay. Maybe this is a good exercise in seeing some of the complexities of the ideas that we're proffering to you and the value of just reviewing it offline along with some of the permitting and hearing stuff um, because we do want to get this handled by the end of the year and um, it's really good just going to take some like thoughtful and very efficient conversations to make that happen okay all right i'll review it um you know and then i'll i'll make my comments um yeah i've had I've got 30 years of enforcing this kind of uh, rules. Okay. okay. Very valuable. And, uh, <laughs> so trained, trained several uh, hunting dogs in, and uh, uh, as well as uh, my family's um, service dog. So uh, plenty of experience there. So we'll, we'll do what we can to help. Thanks, Andre. Um, and, and I think we should, as a subcommittee and Bruce talking to your guests now, be good about putting our informative material all in a folder, not just what we come up with, but like if there's any documentation that we used to come up with those sort of, um, to come up with the stuff that we did, just background information that we should give everything in consideration to the commission. Go ahead, Bruce. So I, I see three things in this. One is that Rachel set us up with a lot of really good questions. So it enables the other people, Andre, Jason, Laura, to comment on something that she didn't already say or to reinforce what she's already said. Two, as far as I know, there's no prohibition against any of you, especially Andre, coming to the subcommittee. We meet next week. And Conceptually, if people wanted to come and join the discussion, they can do that, and then we can solve it. And we could certainly schedule time for specific topics if you're able to join, and Andre and, and everybody. It's, a, it's like a lunchtime meeting. So if there's something particular that you want to 
uh, participate in. I'm seeing Aaron. <laughs> Are you going to tell us it's not allowed, Aaron? Go ahead. No, no, not at all. Um, I was just going to say when we do our notes, our edits, um, I don't know if the formatting, how that was, the comments that Rachel put on that, if they were put in as comments or if they were put in as track changes. Yeah, I wasn't, I, I track changes, but I can do I, comments in the future. I, yeah, I was going to suggest if people have, because it seems like her, her track changes aren't actually track changes. They're just questions or comments. So if people comment as a comment and not as a track change, it will help us to discern because like we, we drafted the, I should say we, the, Alex and the subcommittee drafted the language. And so, um, it's it's sort of in a, like a semi-final format but we're you know i'm sure more changes could happen it's just that it's difficult to go back and edit out the tr as track changes um so just going to suggest that that might be a little better formatting wise to get people's comments on it um as a suggestion okay so use comments in set of track changes everyone i can i can transcribe that to comments and re resend that to you Aaron would that be okay. helpful yeah that'd yeah. be great actually because then I can yeah. I can recirculate um Rachel's comments to the whole board so everybody has the most up-to-date copy maybe that makes great. sense thank you I think it does sort of in yes very thoughtful comments Rachel and I think it inspires greater and in, in more depth thought about you know what we already have and so that's always a springboard for more discussion go ahead Jason do you have any idea how um, <clears throat> often these rules are actually enforced? Yes, um, infrequently. So, so if that's the case, then we're looking at, we have a subcommittee that's looking at rules to make changes to rules for rules that are loosely and infrequently enforced. There is a- Can I, can I comment on yeah, that? Go ahead. Yeah, so- um, part of the reason for this, so this process, the the land management policy editing started about two years ago. Um, this was like when we had sort of the old configuration of the board. It started quite a while ago. Um, and, and part of the reason for this um, is because there was so many variations kicking around town of rules and regulations. Like there's like probably five different web pages on the town of Amherst um, website for different rules and regulation versions over the years. And the whole purpose of this was to consolidate everything and sort of get it into a final format. And, and part of why it's been difficult to enforce is because there's been all these different versions of rules. And when somebody calls to complain, the police or dog officers like, well, which rules are we enforcing? Because nothing's posted. There's all these different versions and variations posted about, and like, we're not really sure what the rules are. So part of the whole point of this is to get a final, complete and succinct version and eliminate all those old outdated versions so that we have like a, um, a solid enforceable um, policy and regulation to, to use in in the field that everybody can um, follow. In the field, meaning on conservation land. Correct. Yeah. And Not so on like town property. Right. So it's just town. If someone lets the dog run around off leash down at the town common. Yeah, that's not that's under a, the care the, custody totally control of, of the rules. conservation commission. Well, so this okay. So the rule for the town is dogs must be on leash. Rule for conservation areas is there's an exception, which is Amethyst Brook, and there is Lower Mill for those designated times. And there's an animal control officer, which is mostly, I think, right, Erin, the enforcer of the animal variance of rules. And that has been the extent of enforcement of any of these rules on conservation lands. And so the, the the biggest issues, you know, I know that it starts with the commercial, but in reality, like, what are we really looking at as the biggest issues? Dogs off leash, people not picking up after their dogs. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just step back with big picture then. Um, so I did send out that, uh, 
that literature review today, which is an overview of the some issues on conservation lands, and they're mostly to do with conservation values. I would say the big picture is that, as we discussed, there's more conflicts, more people, more dogs, and there's um, clear communication from residents that having confrontations with off-lease dogs on conservation lands is problematic. And this is not new, it's just a continuing problem and maybe exacerbated by like recent just number of dog ownerships and number of users on land. So one of the you know additional factors of having more dogs and more people, but mostly more dogs on land and more off-leash dogs is impacts to conservation lands. So to just quickly overview that, again, the purpose of the conservation lands is for conservation values. Dogs on lands have big impacts to conservation values. Dogs off leash have even way bigger conservation impacts to conservation lands. So we are not here discussing whether or not to allow dogs on conservation lands. It's just to rein in the impacts on conservation lands um, by off leash dogs and also make places feel more safe and accessible for other users that have confrontations and issues or avoidance with off-leash dogs. So we're trying to make conservation lands accessible for all residents and trying to balance the use of dogs with conservation values that they were set aside for. Did I do an okay job at describing that? Does anyone, Aaron? <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Just as a matter of background for the commission, it is state law that dogs must be on a leash. Dogs have always been an issue since colonial times because they kill livestock and all that kind of stuff. There's no law about cats, but there is a state law that dogs must be on a leash unless the municipality provides a uh, uh, an area where they can be off leash, there is that possibility. So Amherst is not outside the law by providing off leash hours at certain conservation lands. Um, and that's a bit of background that you haven't been handed yet. Also, the the committee and it was agreed uh, that the chair would tell you that we want to vote on the uh, policies that are before you at the next conservation meeting. I don't think that's come up yet in this conversation. So that's driving part of this conversation. And um, also with regard to um, with regard to conservation land, it's not a refuge. Conservation land is not a wildlife refuge. It's full of multiple use. And people are very much part of that. The zone of influence around every trail is heavily influenced by human beings and dogs. Um, people walk around with loud voices and they affect animals. Um, and dogs running around off leash uh, affect things. But the biggest, inf the biggest problem that we're trying to get a handle on is a balance between the town's inability to enforce these rules and trying to come up with something that where people feel included, but there are limits. And enforcement's a huge issue. The town has enforcement problems. If, if a ticket is issued, it doesn't, it doesn't wind up being usually successful in court. And so the town is often reluctant to um, have a heavy hand. We have conflicts with dogs on leash, off leash, making unwelcome contact with people, particularly children. Um, we have conflicts between dogs where fights occur. Um, the town's not responsible for injuries caused by dogs. And, but there's, there's this balancing trying to take place in writing these rules um, 
so that we admit that there is multiple use, admit that we have an enforcement issue, and try and come up with something that we can post on the website uh, along trails, particularly trailheads. And um, on that memo that I wrote, there are several suggestions, administrative type suggestions, which the subcommittee came up with. We went through quite an exercise to try and uh, suggest to Dave administrative things that the town can do to ameliorate some of these issues beyond simply posting rules. So we've done some pretty hard work on trying to come at this in a way that where these conflicts can be managed and reduced, if not avoided. Um, and that's that's a tough job. So what what Michelle has been talking about is very real. The issue before us is what to do about it. And that's what the subcommittee has been trying to do. And that's what's summarized in the memo. And it, it can't be summarized in the rules. That's why we wrote the memo. So it's good to get your feedback. Um, I don't think there's going to be any right answer. There's just going to be the best we can do. Thanks, Alex. Well said. Jason? It seems like if that all of that Alex just said, uh, you know, the town's not responsible for for it's not incumbent upon the town or the conservation commission or conservation lands to appease people and allow them to walk you know we don't have it seems that that's a it's not our role to like make sure people have a place where their dogs can run off leash and if dogs are really causing this much harm to conservation areas and the only real conservation areas where dogs are allowed off leash are at Amethyst Brook and uh, Mill, was it uh, Mill River? Mill River Park. Yeah, between, you know, sun up and 10 a.m. You know, it just seems like that ought to be the gold standard. Like, you can't have your dog off leash and you have to pick up after your dog. And we don't allow commercial enterprises used on conservation land. I think that that's, I don't, without, but without enforcement, none of this really matters. You can make all the rules you want, but if no one enforces it, the rules don't matter. So, so you, you concur with the rules as written, though? Yeah. Okay. I suppose what I don't concur with necessarily is taking a whole lot of time to discuss rules that seem to not be enforced and are just like the only place where dogs really are allowed off leash in town on public land is Amethyst Brook and Mill River Park. Well, they, they are enforced by the dog, by the animal control officer. And there are fines. And there are repercussions, and those are built into the rules. One of them was um, an exclusion from the conservation areas. So de facto enforcement and, you know, is maybe different. And one of Alec the things Alex was talking about was ways that we've been discussing to um, increase enforceability of these rules. Uh, go ahead, Alec Andre. Andre's first. Yeah, Andre. Uh, well, uh, you just provided a perfect opening uh, for for me. Uh, I was going to ask um, if the animal control officer has been consulted in the during the uh, uh, during the time that uh, you were putting this together, because uh, like you were saying, and like uh, Jason was saying, everything has to be enforced and it has to be enforceable. Um, and maybe they uh, would have a suggestion or some suggestions on uh, A, enforceability and B, uh, I don't know, um, whether something would work or not, or whether they would, whether it's something that they would actually uh, 
you know, want to enforce and so on. Um, so a, a just a, an observation there. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, good yeah. point. Um, we, I guess, we've been relying on Dave to be sort of the liaison for reporting on the animal control officer. But um, as you say it, maybe it would be good to have a conversation with her specifically. For the yeah. If yeah. They, if, if, I agree. Uh, if they have it, and um, there was another thing I was going to say. Um, all right, I get it. <laughs> we'll get to it. Go ahead, Alex. You know, I'll, I'll address the animal control officer second. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in the subcommittee is a change in people's entitlement, sense of entitlement. And Dave told us about an incident where he went out, somebody had their dog off leash, and Dave told them who he was officially told them what the rule was, asked them to put their dog on their leash, and they blew him off and just continued on. There was nothing Dave could do. So we have this change in people's entitlement, um, um, which is tough to deal with. And um, in that rolls right into the inability to enforce some of these. Michelle says it's enforceable, but um, it's 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 very tough. Um, so how to build rules that are reasonable to anybody sense of propriety um, and to even bend a little bit to so that they can see themselves being provided for uh, in the rules if they want to have the dog off leash and maybe we should do that at other places where we have some conflicts to make the root the, the leash law more enforceable by giving people a period of time when they can have their dog off leash I don't know um, just trying to be creative and think out of the box with regard to the animal control officer uh, I didn't contact her on, as we were drafting this, it's something yet to be done. But Aaron reported to us that she mitigates complaints. She'll show up and be nice and try and smooth things out, and it doesn't get reported. And what so what's wanted there in the rules is that um, uh, that she will, as part of her job, as part of her job performance keep a record that's available to the administrative staff at, uh, of Amherst and consequently to the commission so we can see where the hotspots are. I don't know what we do with that data, but right now we don't have a way to track incidences and, um, and to see trends or even to identify where on the 2,000 acres that we've gotten the 80 miles of trails are, is most of this occurring and so that record keeping that's in there is a is a request to get a handle on on a better handle on on dog issues so it's as michelle alluded this the, there were hearings public hearings that were extremely tense with people on both sides that wanted less rules and other people that didn't want dogs on conservation land. And um, Dave was part of that. And, and the rules that we started with came out of that conflict. And we've tried to modify them to, to address some of the things that have come up since. Like Dave, was it was reported to Dave that a woman was coming down from Brattleboro, who's a paid dog walker, to use Amherst's trails to walk those dogs and bring them back to, 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 to Brattleboro. And, and he didn't like that a bit. Um, so um, that was one of the motivations behind putting it in the rules that there, that there won't be commercial use, dog use on the land. And that fits with the other prohibition of commercial use on conservation land. 
maybe we can bend a little bit to allow for the little old lady who would like to have her dogs get some exercise. And this doesn't go into at all the discussion about the fact that being able to run around and burn off some energy is very healthy for dogs and it keeps them from going neurotic. Um, that's, but, but that's not a, we get into a whole discussion about that's not the purpose of conservation land, but it is part and parcel of the discussion. So it's, we've spent a lot of time on this in the committee and what you've got in front of us, in front of you is the best we can come up with to date. And it was decided to put it out in front of you for your comments. Rachel so far is the only one who commented. So if you want to look at it and provide us some comments, we'll take it back to the subcommittee and and do what we can with it and bring it back to you. It, it may not be ripe for a vote at your next meeting. What you'll have in front of you is the conservation and the agricultural policy. I had hoped to put the forest management policy in front of you tonight for your review. That was held back at Michelle's request so that we could rethink carbon credits. So we're going to have a discussion at our next subcommittee meeting on the forest management pride, uh, policy, a narrow discussion about carbon credits. And we may invite a previous commissioner in to talk about it who's fairly knowledgeable. And Michelle has provided some literature, which we'll consider. So unfortunately, these kinds of things eat up a lot of time. And I'm very concerned about making our goal of getting all the policies done by the end of the calendar year. So yeah, there's some pressure to move this along and, um, and yet um, allow you folks time to think about it because it's gonna come back to you for a vote. And what we don't, what I don't want is to have this kind of discussion at the end of the calendar year. And I have to come back and ask for another extension. I'd rather have you consider it piece by piece and vote on each piece as we go along and have these discussions as warranted. Thanks, Alex. Um, so to piggyback on Alex's first section of that, um, the subcommittee has done site visits and come up with, um, I think, some great ideas about enforceability or to sort of sway public um, sentiment or com com um, compliance. Um, a lot of that has to do with signage and sort of changing the atmosphere of um, acceptability for just taking your dog off leash during on leash hours, things like that. And I don't think they're incorporated in these rules, but just to let you know that we have a good sort of list of ideas that we've um, talked about that I think, I think are really implementable and hopeful. And so just to address your concern, Jason, about enforceability, like, yes, these are the rules and we have a sort of separate list of ideas based on our site visits that we think will help to support compliance, if not enforceability. Um, secondarily, Alex, I wonder if maybe the subcommittee's role could be to come up with um, our sections and then we are done with it and then they're on to the next stage, which is the full commission. And so um, if we're done by, we can finish our sections by uh, December, but then the rest of it is sitting in full commission. We could talk about that later, but just different methods, understanding that people's um, time commitments are different on the commission and um, some things elicit more discussion than others. Maybe we can just think about other ways to approach um, finishing up sections within our time frame. Go ahead, Andre. Um, Alex mentioned earlier uh, the how the how the um, ACO animal control officer is um, enforcing uh, the uh, laws, and um, I'm wondering if uh, the if there is a record of how much uh, you, uh, Alex you alluded to it, but. Uh, is there a record of uh, how many violations have been uh, issued over the last uh, 
you know, year by year over the last several years and how many warnings and so on, or is there no record of that whatsoever? Or have yeah, we heard from? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Aaron, Aaron, do you want to take, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Um, I don't have any records. I'm not sure if Dave has any records. Um, from what, and again, I, you know, I don't want to talk out of turn because I don't really know um, how what goes on. But uh, I guess um, anecdotally, I've heard that um, a lot of, like, say, let's say somebody calls with a complaint that a lot of um, uh, the task of the animal control officer is to come and sort of mediate the complaint. And that sometimes the complaint is mediated and at the end of the, you know, the visit, there's no... Um, you know, ticket issued or any citation or anything. And so as a result, it's just like a call. And so there's no um, sort of log of what's happening. But I think part of, you know, one of the things the committee had discussed when we were out on our site visit was having a reporting form so that if there was a call for a of some type of issue that we'd have a form that would be filled out and returned to us. And that way we would have some log, even if it was a, the issue was resolved, there'd be some log that would basically document, you know, what was reported, how was the, what was the outcome that was achieved at the end of the visit and kind mm -hmm. of give us a sense so we could start tracking it a little bit more. Um, again, you know, I think that the idea of, of, potentially sharing this with the um, animal control officers a really great idea. And I think um, maybe having a, a conversation with her to see, you know, there may be stuff that, that we don't know. And it's really just because like my job doesn't intersect with her job. We don't really, you know, that, and, and I think Dave might know more because he might intersect with her more, but um, you know, there may be ways that we can connect um, or just document What's going on? Yeah, I think there could be a simple log with something, uh, you know, a type of uh, complaint, whether it's a dog bite or a uh, some, you know, some, or just loose dogs, and then whether it's been um, substantiated, and then whether it was a warning or a uh, uh, or a or a violation notice, meaning a yeah. Something. So it's a good point, Andre, and we specifically talked about that on our site visit, and that was one of the things I was talking about. Um, our ideas for trying to start having more um, tracking and culpability for this, but is my understanding that there is no tracking currently and that it's all handled very uh, case by case and um, there's no record of things happening. So we specifically talked about, like Aaron said, having some kind of uh, record keeping basis that we can start keeping track of it. So um, I'm thinking Alex hearing some feedback that maybe we should sort of collate our ideas that we came up with for specifically uh, dog regulations when we were on Wentworth. Like um, we came up with like a, a, a having a forum on the kiosk, like did an incident happen, then call this number, use this QR code, whatever. So we, we have a very good list of ideas and I think that they're worth sharing with you. So I think maybe in conjunction with reading the memo, the rules, we're gonna provide our ideas for how to make this all work. And um, then you can read it all together. But I think really importantly is that everybody takes the um, and, you know intent of this discussion back and uh, you know looks at Rachel's comments, looks at the, looks at what we have so far and provide some feedback um, because ultimately we do need a vote on these things to get this done with. Go ahead, Alex. I just want to come back to the animal control officer. She works for the police department. It doesn't work for Dave. So administratively, in order to put something in her performance standards to cause her to do this reporting, it's either you know, modify her performance standards and make it part of her job that she gets graded on, or it's out of the kindness of her heart or a combination of the two. Dave's very good at relationships. And I think the first, the first order of business would be a phone call from Dave to her saying, can we work something out rather than going to the police department and trying to muscle some change in her performance standards. It's always better to do something by agreement and then give her the benefit of, of giving her credit by changing her performance standards. But 
there is there is not a ready-made avenue for communication just because of administrative where where she fits in town. So um, that's an issue, and we just have to work with it. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I think that these rules are good, and you know, I mentioned enforcement before. Can we, as a conservation commission, ask the animal control officer? to potentially do something like visit some of the conservation lands where there are issues and like go there on a rotating basis, like once a month, go to one place, one, one, you know, parkland or some, or trailhead and sit there and just literally hand out some paper warning saying, Hey, you're not allowed to have your dog off leash. I'm the animal control officer. These are warnings for now, but please just be informed that enforcement is going to step up and like just have some sort of like presence as opposed to just, you know, a sign. I mean, I go to a trailhead with my dogs and my kids. I'm not like, hey, let's stop to read this sign. You know, uh, we just go. And generally, I'm either like somebody's running ahead, you know, like it's not like uh whatever information is on that sign is not necessarily being read by everybody using <clears throat> walking past that sign. Right. So having the presence and, and having that person who is actually responsible for enforcing these rules, just being out there and showing up once in a while and saying, Hey, here's a, here's a paper warning. And then at the very least can say here, I, I went to the field with a hundred of these printed flyers and I came back with 12. So I gave out that many today and then eventually like, okay, well now it's time to stop doing the warnings and start handing out tickets. Can we request that of that person? Thanks, Jason. Um, we specifically talked about both those things, funny enough, and Alex um, has some great ideas for signage and uh, visibility of signage. Um, and we talked about having maybe like trail docents. And I think that was a Bruce idea where I think that the capacity of the animal control officer maybe doesn't fit with that um, additional um, responsibility. But we talked about having like a, even developing a trail commission and maybe part of their responsibilities could be volunteer trail sort of docent and things like that. Um, and again, that's why I want to give these great ideas that we came up with to you guys to to review to see how these could be implementable. But yeah. yeah, we're all on the same page. Um, I, sorry, um, and Michelle, I just, yeah, I just want to say with the trail dosing thing, like Alex brought up the entitlement of people. Like, I'm going to use the parlance of our term: having some uh, times having somebody out there that's perceived as some Karen that just wants to tell everybody else what to do that has no official capacity to actually do anything about it may not have the desired effect. The person who is actually able to enforce the rules should at the very least be visible at some time. Like I've lived in town for three years and I don't, I, I couldn't tell you who the animal control officer is. And I've certainly never seen that person at any one of the conservation lands and we go to them often. Yeah. So, you know, but I've had, you know, but you have some random person be like, Hey, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And it's like, Oh, okay. Sorry. You know, like I don't I don't do that. I don't have my dog off leash on conservation lands, but I see plenty of them off leash all the time there. So I just don't know. I, I you know, and, and then it can you're potentially introducing like people being disrespectful, you know, to that docent. And um that's I don't I don't want to necessarily be advocating to put people in that position. I agree, Jason. I specifically would not <laughs> ever do that. But uh, Alex had success in his one-off. <laughs> um, go ahead, Andre. And I, I just do want to just be mindful of uh, the time here and, and like our purpose, which is probably that we've opened a can of worms, which everybody knew that this was going to be. And I think that we all are going to go back and, and provide some thoughtful comments. Um, and I don't think that any of our other sections will even be close to this complicated, really. But I see your hand, Aaron. Go ahead. Um, oh, Andre. Okay. 
<laughs> Jason, uh, I I like your ideas. Um, I I'm I just wanted to point out a couple things. I I you know although the uh, what it says in the um, in the draft policy uh, is that the ACO enforces Amherst dog regulate uh, regulation. Uh, APD, the Amherst police do as well, and they also enforce, they don't enforce any of the dog regulations? I think they leave it to the dog officer. Well, I think you'd find that uh, that the that they that the police uh, can too. And they also would uh, be able to enforce the uh, the conservation, uh, some of the conservation stuff, right? I don't know. You can't get them to pull over somebody with only one headlight. Yeah, I think uh, uh, mm. realistically, their priorities probably aren't going to be responding to an off-leash dog. No, Maybe. But, if they, but if you call them, they will. Really? Okay. You call, well, Timely? You call, then they have to... Well, they, they'd be put on their list of things to right. So they it's need on to do. In other words, it'd be oh, I... you know someone would get a call, would get dispatched out there. Um, and I thought that our uh, that the um, conservation land manager and the uh, assistant conservation land manager also have the ability to issue tickets. Is that right, Erin? I haven't heard that. Um, that's a really interesting question, though, Andre, and I'll look into that. Um, I did interview for that job at one time, at one point. Oh, okay. So that you was listed as uh, as part of the uh, <laughs> as part of the uh, uh, responsibility duties and responsibilities. So at least for the uh, assistant uh, huh. conservation land uh, manager. So. Um, Interesting. Just, just to me I'm mentioning these things, not to say that uh, let's use these folks, but to say that there is, there are more folks who can uh, enforce, who can kind of be a part of this uh, team, if you would, and they are people that we can ask to do things uh, such as uh, a quick operation where you show up uh, for a half hour and and. Uh, educate the public. Um, Jason's idea of uh, of slowly introducing the uh, laws and uh, and the enforcement of it, I think, is uh, your spot on, Jason. Uh, that's the way to do it. But anyway, that's that's why I'm bringing that up, and I uh, think that we, uh, you know, the more ideas we come up with like that, the uh, clearer picture we we're going to end up with. Yeah, good idea, Sandra. Thanks, uh, Alex. It's um, in either what's before you or in the write-up for the Wentworth site visit, I have the number for the police department. And um, I actually called the number because it, it had a funny name. It's it's telephone. I don't I don't know what the what it's called. Like it's a three word thing. Anyways, I said to them, is there a reason you're called this, like a dispatch center? She says, yeah. Phone calls come in here for the police department, the fire department, the EMT, ambulance, and dog warden, and I have to figure out who to send the call to. So this isn't just the police department. And I said, so if a call comes in with regard to dogs, what do you do with it? She says, I send it to the to the to Carol. So that's what they do. And that was my homework in trying to <laughs> track that down just because of of what what that position is called. And it isn't just the police department, uh, even though it's in my phone is the Amherst Police Department. And the other thing about Carol is, without getting personal, she has mobility issues. So she might be able to stand at the trailhead, but you're not going to find her traipsing down um, a trail for a mile or two. She would probably, um, she might if she had to, but she has mobility issues. And so, um, as I said, she might be able to show up at a trailhead. But... Um, 
um, that's a I don't want to get into that personal stuff. So this has been a good conversation. Uh, now you know kind of what's been going on, the kinds of things that's been happening in the subcommittee meeting as we were limited to one hour in order to accommodate people's work schedules. And um, uh, it's amazing how, how, how much time some of these issues take to try and figure out a way forward. So we can improve on what you've got but what you've got now is the best we've been able to come up with uh, in the hours that we've spent on it. And with regard to enforceability, the same enforceability issues will exist for every single policy that comes in front of you. Absolutely true. Um, probably this one will try, you know, frequency of need for enforceability is probably gonna be highest of this of anything else, obviously. Um, and, you know, we had, we didn't start from ground zero on this one. We inherited rules and we fine tuned them and we developed them and we sort of brought them up to speed. So um, we are basing this on, you know, prior knowledge and experience of other commissioners and other directors and with Dave also. So I think um, I'd like to wrap this up. Um, and now you've all been introduced to the complexity of some of the issues that the subcommittee has been dealing with. And um, we greatly appreciate just, you know, your comments on the documents. And um, this has sort of been our first try at bringing it forth to you. And again, I'll say it again, this is probably going to be the most complicated. So might as well start there. Um, possibly, I don't know, Alex, help me think about some dates, some uh, target dates for receiving comments so that we have time to incorporate them on our schedule like uh no. and maybe commissioners chime in with what your reasonable turnaround could be i guess andre and jason specifically so you want me to go first sure so the the objective has been to put at least one issue one policy issue in front of the commission each meeting and give you opportunity to comment. And then it goes, the com and we set a deadline for the comments. It goes back into committee, we deal with the comments. Rachel gave us good comments, for example, on the agricultural uh, policy. She also gave us good comments on the dog policy. Rachel, so far, is the only one who's been commenting. And we would like to hear from others if you care. Um, if you if you're going to be silent, we assume you have no comment because when it comes up for a vote, I would like to say that you've had time to comment and now it's just time to vote rather than holding a big discussion just because there's a vote. Um, that said, there needs to be some. I don't know how to gauge whether or not there is uh, should be discussion by the board, the Conservation Commission on each policy before they vote. I guess it would be like a hearing where it kind of, the policy comes up, there's opportunity for discussion, and then there's a motion for a vote. I guess that, that is our norm, and maybe that's the best way to do it. But if, if the discussion results in the thing going back to the committee, okay, so be it. Uh, we would hope that we would have a good enough policy in front of you that it would pass. And um, so in terms of a schedule, I, I had planned and was going to give you uh, another policy tonight uh, that got pulled back at the last minute. And um, so I'd like to go back to that and you put up a deadline mm -hmm. and then schedule a vote for every CONCOM meeting from now to the end of the calendar year on the on the policies that are in front of you for which you all have commented. And I would, Michelle said, we'll figure out what to do with it after this committee folds at the end of the calendar year and then it's in front of the commission. I'm hoping, I've been working on this policy since I joined the commission, that was two years ago. And it's time to put it to bed. 
And I'm hoping that the work of the subcommittee results in that and that it doesn't come on and have another life. We got other things to do. Okay, I mean, that's really dependent on everyone doing their homework and being ready to vote. So I can't pull teeth on that one. <laughs> uh, Bruce, go ahead. You're muted. Rachel. Uh, just a procedural question. It sounds like there was a lot of there was a lot of public comment um, previously in public meetings. Um, would we have to have public comment for this um, discussion and review? Well, so it'll it's put on the agenda, um, and then there's public comment, which we haven't gotten to yet. So it's posted publicly and the public are welcome to come comment on it. I don't think we're going to be like advertising. I don't, I don't know how it got so um, popular last time, but um, we're not doing anything under the rug. Go ahead, Erin. <laughs> so under state law, um, when you're passing rules and regulations for conservation land, you have to hold a public hearing. So the idea would be, let's get it as refined as possible. And then once we have a document to present, we do a public, we would post a legal ad um, and put a notice in the paper and put it on the agenda to to dedicate uh, time on the agenda to take public comment if people show up for it. Um, and then presumably, you know, depending on how much attention it garners or people you know, comments and, and so forth, you know, we might finish it in one hearing or it might take multiple to take comment and, and refine it or whatever the case at the commission's discretion. How much time is it, uh, is it out for public comment? Is... I mean, um, so in order to like, I think that's, it depends. Um, so for, uh, the open space and recreation plan we posted stuff we created a little website um and then we provided a link to the website on you know our advertisements that we put on the town website but you know i would suspect something something similar to that i wouldn't want to you know post it everywhere like i <laughs> you know i would want to just do our standard legal process for it um and maybe have a website with links and maybe some background um information on how how this document was developed, um, just so that people aren't um, coming in not knowing what the backstory was for developing all of this. Okay. Michelle, uh, there's some weird sound here. Let me mute and unmute. Um, there, uh, you had asked uh, earlier when we could um review and provide comments back um next wednesday or next uh or cob next friday for me depending on what we agree the 20th andre yeah okay uh that's uh 20th would be what uh the uh, friday yes yeah yeah, either or, Wednesday or Friday. Doesn't matter. Okay, thanks, Andre. And and to keep in mind that we're going to start peppering you with other sections of this. Um, so maybe get on a schedule. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify you know, kind of what Andre just said with, or what you just said with schedule. Are you talking about specifically our schedule for the, the dog? Because I feel like I've made my comments tonight. Um, are you still looking for written comments to the dog policy or are you talking about future policies that come before us okay good question so it's good to know that we've received your comments tonight so we will not expect anything else from you and if um andre you want to give additional comments we'll look for that i think timeline for um other sections um alex you probably do you want to chime in on that one I'm not sure what I was chiming in and I was going to. Oh, I, I guess trying to give some. Jason. Yeah, guidance for general scheduling of when comments are expected back. Yeah, I guess I have a comment on that. Go ahead. And I also um, just want to say to Jason, I didn't take any notes 
when you were speaking. So I um, I don't recall. I'll put them in the notes. Okay. I can summarize for you if you want. That would help. Uh, I have no comment on the comments. I have no comments on the written rules. I think they're fine. My comment is that enforcement is paramount for any rules and nothing's going to change if there's no enforcement. Okay. okay. And then so in, in terms of schedule, Michelle, the, the comments need to come back to the subcommittee in time for it to consider those comments. So the subcommittee meets in the week that the commission does not. So um, it won't meet this week, but it'll meet next week. So if people were gonna submit comments, it would be nice to get them to Aaron by Friday or Sunday night. I don't really care so long as we can get them um, on Monday and Tuesday and, and have time for us to consider them before we actually have a meeting, uh, which is on Tuesday at noon. We the meet 17th. Yeah. So if you could have comments to Aaron uh, either Friday or sometime over the weekend, if you are so inclined, she can get them to us on Monday. Sounds good. Go ahead, Aaron. Just a reminder to Alex. So if I'm going to publish the, um, the, the agenda. Ag agenda for next Tuesday, that I'll need it tomorrow before noon. Um, yeah, I, I can do that. Awesome. I always forget because I'm so bogged down with meeting stuff and I just thought of it. Yeah, so next Tuesday we're going to talk about, the first thing we're going to talk about is forest management and carbon credits and dedicate a certain amount of time for that. And then we're coming back to, um, um, I guess it's dogs. Jason? Yeah, I want to just make sure we're setting realistic expectations here. So are you saying that, so will a new policy, let's just use this forest management, will come are these coming in our packets? So it comes in the packet to us on like Tuesday or Thursday, the week prior to a meeting. You all are meeting that same week that we get our packets. No, no. Week hey. after. No. Yeah. Erin puts out her packets. Typically, you know, sometimes it's on Wednesday. Um, and And sometimes we because of when we meet, we don't get her uh, something for the subcommittee folder in time for her to send it out or put it in by the time she sends you the link. But we do get it in as soon as we can so that you can read it before your commission meeting. Um, it's a little tight for us to meet on Tuesday and get her something by Wednesday, but we can we can do that. Well, I'm just I'm I'm just want to know what the expectation is. We yeah, get it in the packet. Where you want comments back by that Friday, the yeah. Friday that we receive the packet. Yeah. Well, well, I think what we've been doing is it comes in the packet. We do a little introduction to it, or just to notify you it's there, and we need comments back by, and usually give like a week or two on that set. So there's like a lag time in between when you get it and when we won't get it. We wouldn't give it to you Thursday and expect comments on the following Wednesday. Yeah, and my, personally, when you send the packets out, Aaron, generally I don't look at them till that weekend, right? Or like look at it, browse through it very quickly one night during the week, right? Just time-wise when I have time to look at it. So I want to make sure the expectation is not that we are responding by potentially that Friday that we receive the packet. So we have like a week to respond. No. I think you have a week and a half, so a right? Half? Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. That's just, that's what I want to clarify. So if I could, just to restate what I think Jason is saying, if you get um, some policy in the packet, 
for the following CONCOM meeting. We would like to have your comments on that policy by the Friday of the CONCOM week. So you're asking for within like three days, two to three days? Well, um, I see yes. Andre shaking his head, but we, we would need that comment for our meeting on Tuesday the following week. Seems tight. But yeah, three days is not going to do it for me. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. Me neither. But the, you know, uh, if you put it out um, in the, then, then before your next meeting, we would, uh, I could do that. I think it's reasonable to put, if we receive it in the packet, that we have comments back to you by our next CONCOM meeting, which gives us roughly a week. In a weekend, yes. Yeah, I mean, so far the comment periods have been two weeks for each. Yeah, I think we're From getting- From the date of the meeting when we provide them to you, there's mm -hmm. been like a two week comment period. So, so okay. the end of the calendar year isn't that far away and yeah. the number of times the CONCOM meets. So you may wind up, we may wind up doubling up the number of policies that you get. Um, dogs is probably the most complicated in terms of controversy. The ag policy is probably the most complicated in terms of length and detail. The rest are pretty straightforward. I think the forest management thing is a quarter of a page. Okay, so how about the um, week of CONCOM meeting? So that everybody has a week, including a weekend, and then subcommittee has time to review comments and discuss it for the next meeting. So Jason or Andre suggested that one. Does that work, Alex? I'm having a hard time with a calendar in my head. Yeah. Um, I it mean, sounds we're, like we're there, would be, there would be a lag. There would be a lag, but it would provide us time to at least all of us also time to review comments, which is also a thing. Um, well, so, so, long as, so long as we've got policies going <laughs> to the commission every time it meets, we will roll out all there is and get comments back and have a vote on all of that, I, I think, by the end of the calendar year. And that's okay. the goal. Let's make that the goal. That's yeah. the goal is to not is to get it all done and not ask for an extension. I'd okay. like I'd like to be done with this policy thing. It takes a lot of time. Sure does. Um okay. So I think that's gonna be our our goal here is to give you guys something in your packet every week and please review it and give us comments. And if the comments are, I have no comment, that it, that's also informative. At least we know you read it and you're on board and you know what we're talking about. Um, and then we will double up the easy ones and we're gonna be done with this by the end of 2024. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, if that's I could just add a little layer of complication so the commission knows when I started working on this, when I first came on, Aaron said, we're all reviewing this. Please go through the document, which was just rules, just rules, and review it. And oh, by the way, there's a big rush. So I rushed to get through it. And I was perhaps one of the last ones to go through it. Michelle went through it the June before I came on the board and said, in, and, um, then it sat for like three or four months while Dave looked at it and he wanted to be last. And then we formed this committee. And at first we thought, oh, our job is to simply go through and polish up the rules. Dave wanted something like a management plan so that he could refer to it on what he's supposed to do. Now, we had to separate what's policy and stay away from administrative stuff. And yet he wanted to, to us to produce something like a land management plan, which we have not done. But that's what he wanted. And and we're we're not going to we're not going to get there. But, uh, for example, um, what lands are we managing for uh, grassland species? And when what are we supposed to do there? And 
um, all that kind of stuff. And um, so our job got a little bit more complicated when Dave joined the subcommittee meetings. He's not a committee member, he's not a commissioner, but he has a wealth of knowledge uh, to offer, which has been very useful. And he has a plan in his head on where he wants to go. And he wanted this document to sort of evolve into a document that he could point to on why he's doing something. And ah, unfortunately, I think he's a little frustrated because we're we're that's that's we're we're not drafting a land management plan. And um, uh, maybe someday that'll happen, but uh, not in this iteration. So we've got this thing that you'll see. And part of it starting with dogs, where we've got the rules, and then we got this memo where we suggest administrative things that might be helpful. And that kind of a memo may come with the other policies. And the other thing that we realized is that the policy is kind of a hodgepodge. And you wonder, well, why, how's this going to get used? And Aaron would say, well, we want to rip it out of the policy document and stick it up on kiosks well then it needs some heading like rachel pointed out to explain what it is and that kind of stuff that's a different kind of a document so it wasn't quite clear what this document what the policy thing is supposed to look like a lot of that depends on the uses and some of that's still not ironed out so we're going forward with strictly policy and right now what we've got is this memo from the commission to Dave outlining administrative steps that might be helpful in administering the policy. And that's kind of where we're at. Thanks for the background, Alex. It was a good explanation of the complexity and evolution of this. So everybody, when we give you something, just know <laughs> where it's coming from. Um, public comment, if there's any comment, please raise your hand and I'm gonna keep an eye on the room. Bruce, go ahead. I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm seeing no hands in the room. Second. All right, we have Bruce in the motion, Andre on the second, Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye, and I wanna thank everybody for hanging in there on this discussion and participating and giving us feedback. It is very valuable. Bruce. Aye. Rachel. Aye. And I'm an aye. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for your time tonight. Good night, all. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.